Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we are so thrilled that you all had time in your schedule to uh, join us for the last lecture. My name is Pam Zarkowski, and I am so grateful and blessed to be able to serve as provost and vice president for academic affairs for Detroit Mercy. And many of you are aware of the last lecture, but just to give you a little bit of background, the last lecture was something that was started at Mercy College by Clint Hurst, I have that correct, where he invited faculty to give the lecture um, as if it were their last, long before the book was published with that same title. We missed a great opportunity um, in terms of fundraising, I think, uh, where we could have published all of these. Uh, what a great idea that would have been. And uh, when I took the position of Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, one of the areas that report to me was the Honors Program. And under the uh, leadership of Dave Kokel, uh, the last lecture was incorporated as part of our Honors induction ceremony. So when the honor students who are in the undergraduate program here are inducted into the program, a faculty member is invited to give the last lecture uh, to the students that are being inducted and their guests. And so I thought ready-made speech, right? Um, and second, why not uh, repeat that so that folks like you, we have faculty, students, guests to the university, could hear what the students and their parents and their guests heard and really, again, keep the Mercy last lecture alive. And so this is our third, I believe. We have uh, one of our former speakers here, Dr. Heather Hill Vasquez. Where are you, Heather? Um, was a speaker and Laurie Britt Smith and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Jim Tubbs, Dr. James B. Tubbs, uh, is a professor of ethics and religion and chair of the Department of Religious Studies. He teaches courses in healthcare ethics, Christian ethics, ethics and public health, and social justice. A graduate of Hamden Sydney College in Virginia, Jim earned his MA and PhD degree from the University of Virginia and has been on the faculty of Mercy College of Detroit and then the University of Detroit Mercy since 1986. His publications include journal articles, book reviews, case studies, book chapters, and two books, Christian Theology and Medical Ethics, Four Contemporary Approaches, published in 1996, and a handbook of bioethic terms, published in 2009. Jim serves on Detroit Mercy's Human Subjects Research Review Board, two hospital ethics committees, and chairs the Ethics Advisory Committee of the Presbyterian Village of Michigan. He is also an adjunct lecturer in the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine. And I have to tell you, every now and then, as, as we all travel, I run into someone who's an expert in ethics uh, at various places, and they'll say, do you know Jim Tubbs? And I'll say, well, yes, I do. And so, I've got a, you know, a positive on that side of the uh, ledger. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Jim Tubbs as he pre presents Grateful Living, What Does It Mean to Live in a Grateful Way? Welcome. Uh, thank you, Pam, for inviting me to deliver this last lecture. And thanks to all of you for making time during the midst, in the midst of a busy final exam week to be here. Now. Um, as was just mentioned, in terms of truth in advertising, you should know that much of this last lecture was presented once before. The first version of it was presented to our honors students as the last lecture at their induction ceremony in October of 2015. Now, at, uh, then I was asked to speak on the same subject for a broader audience here today. Um, since I was asked to keep the honors students lecture to about 20 minutes, you can rest assured that even with revisions, this last lecture will not drone on and on until we're all dead or wish we were. <clears throat> now, when I was originally trying to think through what I might say in a last lecture, I kept thinking that the adjective last is always relative to some particular endpoint. So it could refer to the last lecture I give before retiring from my position here at UDM, or the last lecture I'm able to give while still active in retirement, or perhaps what I might say when I'm dying. So I decided to focus on what I might want to say to you on any or all of those occasions. But as a segue into what I want to talk to you about today, I'll begin in a rather unorthodox way by recommending to you a movie I saw a couple years ago. 
a movie that I found more inspiring and more challenging than anything I had seen in a while. It's not an action picture or a mystery or a romance, although it's certainly a love story. It's a documentary film entitled Blood Brother that was released in 2013 and won the jury prize and the audience prize uh, at the Sundance Film Festival that year. I first saw it on PBS, but I know it's available not only through PBS, but through Netflix and Amazon and other sources as well. Now the movie, Blood Brother, <clears throat> is the true story of a young, a young man named Rocky Brat. Rocky comes from what we would call a broken home. His father disappeared when Rocky was a toddler. His mother was a drug addict whose boyfriends were abusive to her children. And his sister is a somewhat distant and unreliable person. Rocky does manage to graduate from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh and get a good job as a graphic designer. But despite his otherwise comfortable existence, he feels a certain emptiness or disconnect in his life. So he decides to quit his job, at least temporarily, and travel, seeking what he calls authenticity. His travels take him to India, and while there he visits an orphanage near Chennai, for uh, <clears throat> children with HIV AIDS and a few of their infected mothers as well. He ends up spending most of his vacation in India with those children. And after his return to Pittsburgh, he decides to sell everything he owns and return to India to live and help out at the orphanage. Now, this is a shock to everybody who knows him. After all, Rocky hates hot weather and has never been particularly fond of children. But Rocky is determined that these outcast, literally outcast children, who call him Rocky Abba, or Brother Rocky, will not be left alone in their disease and poverty, and especially that they will not have to die alone. He has no professional skills in medicine, nursing, dentistry, teaching, administration, or even childcare. And at first, that means that he cannot get a permanent visa in India. So he has to return to the U.S. temporarily after a couple of years, but only long enough to get his visa renewed, and then he goes back. By this time, Rocky's best friend and longtime roommate, Steve Hoover, is really baffled at what could be driving or motivating Rocky to continue choosing a life amidst dirt poverty, rats, insects, and sick and dying children. In search of answers, he follows Rocky to India and documents his life there. Steve then is the director of Blood Brother and also its narrator, raising questions I'm sure many of us would like to ask, and as Rocky's best friend, getting more open and direct answers than many other questioners would probably get. The film offers a number of evidences of some of the positives in the life Rocky has built for himself in India but it never really offers any clear single answer to Steve's original question of what drove Rocky back there, back there in the first place. Many of the film's critics have marveled at Rocky's rather Mother Teresa-like self-sacrifice for others, or the inspiring openness uh, and hopefulness of the children that you meet in the film. And some have essentially said, well, it's just too good to be true. One critic blasted the filmmakers for not being more forthcoming about Rocky's religious faith, he is an evangelical Christian, and suggested that his real motive may not have been helping the children on their own terms, but instead proselytizing and trying to convert them. But the reason that I begin with telling you about this film is that I saw in it something else driving Rocky, at least in part, namely a profound sense of gratitude he left a comfortable life with good friends, a good job, and a good professional future, all things that most of us would aspire to. But what he found in the children in the orphanage from the beginning was a pure and simple openness about their needs, their hopes, and their fears, an affirmation and adoption of Rocky as their family, a kind and degree of family that he had never known before, and a very basic joy in his presence, journeying with them there. And the same Rocky who had said of his own past relationships that there's a freedom in not being close to anyone, had been able to find a new and much more fulfilling kind of freedom in that orphanage. And that's a lot to be grateful for. 
and the notion of gratitude is the topic for this last lecture because I consider gratitude to be one of the fundamental needs or requirements of our lives together and also the source of real satisfaction in our individual lives. To begin with, gratitude essentially means our response of thankfulness and appreciation to some other for some benefit that they have bestowed on us. Now we can certainly be thankful and appreciative that certain conditions exist in our lives, that we are born with no serious genetic diseases or that we're able to live where we live, for example. But we can only be grateful to another for something they've said or done to benefit us and we can be grateful for that benefit. Philosophers point out that my gratitude, my grateful response to someone else, has four basic elements. A cognitive element, an affective element, a, a communicative element, and a behavioral element. The cognitive element simply means that I must judge or believe and continue to believe that something has been said or done for my benefit. The affective element has to do with my positive senses or feelings of thankfulness, feelings of joy or pleasure or goodwill or even affection, for example. The communicative element of gratitude means that I will tend to acknowledge what has been said or done for my benefit and to communicate, express, or demonstrate my thankfulness to the other who brought that about. And finally, the behavioral element of gratitude has to do with our actions or our willingness to act in response to the benefit that we're grateful for. So for example, I may want to give a thank you gift or resolve to try to do a favor in the future for someone who has benefited me in some particular way. Now having said these things definitionally about the notion of gratitude, what can we say about its significance? What role or roles does gratitude play in our lives? I would bet that none of us has ever met anyone who would say that gratitude is simply unimportant or irrelevant. But how important is it and why? Many have argued that gratitude is essentially a fundamental moral obligation, that social structures and social relations are simply unthinkable without some notion of gratitude as a moral duty. Now on the flip side, this would mean that ingratitude that is the absence of fail or failure of gratitude would be a significant moral failure or wrong. And many philosophers have not been shy about making that exact point. The Roman Stoic philosopher Seneca, for example, claimed that ungrateful people rank below thieves, rapists, and murderers. The Scottish philosopher David Hume claimed that of all the crimes that human creatures are capable of committing, the most horrid and unnatural is ingratitude. And of course we know that Shakespeare's King Lear agreed with that, at least in terms of his children's ingratitude. And the German philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote that ingratitude, along with envy and malice, constituted the essence of vileness and wickedness. Well, clearly, these guys conceived of gratitude not just as a positive thing or a good thing, but as something owed by persons to others. And that's a very common, perhaps supermajority, assumption. After all, most of us, at least most of us in the English-speaking world, rather routinely talk about people having debts of gratitude toward other people. But if we do have debts of gratitude, how do we know that we have such debts? What is the source of that sense of obligation? Some have argued that gratitude is simply a reactive human sentiment that occurs naturally, much like envy or resentment are said to be natural responses of people. Of course, another account of duties of gratitude may be religious. The idea that divine powers make certain claims upon us in response to what those divine powers have done for us for which we should be thankful. Uh, so for example, in the Hebrew scriptures, some of the earliest sets of religious and social commandments, the Holiness Code in Leviticus and the Deuteronomic Code in Deuteronomy, included what we call gleaning laws. These laws stated that landowners should not harvest all their crops, 
but should leave at least the borders of their fields unharvested so that strangers, widows, and orphans could glean the remaining grains or olives or grapes and thus have some source of sustenance. Now this was not simply a command to be charitable toward poor people. Rather, as the book of Deuteronomy points out, it's a command to express gratitude for what the Hebrew people had been given. They had been strangers, indeed slaves, in Egypt, a needy people with no land holdings and no rights. But the Lord their God had brought them out from there and had made covenant promises to them. So in response, they are expected to come to the aid of those who are like they were in Egypt, namely persons who have no land or cattle of their own and have nobody to depend upon for their material needs. One other possible source of the notion of duties of gratitude is described by the influential 20th century philosopher W.D. Ross. Ross argued that our moral duties or obligations are not known to us through divine revelation or through human reason alone discovering some eternal moral law. Rather, he says, we come to know our basic moral obligations through our moral intuition coupled with our experiences of living among other people. According to him, we learn our moral obligations through the relationships in which we live with others, uh, such as the relations of promisee to promiser, creditor to debtor, wife to husband, parent to child, friend to friend, or fellow countryman to fellow countrymen, and so on. Through these relationships, we come to recognize that we have certain moral duties to others, duties not to harm other people, duties to ma maximize the aggregate good of the community, duties to keep our promises, duties to repay our debts and to make right the wrongs that we do to others, and duties of gratitude, that is, duties to return thanks or favors from those from whom we have received benefits. So there have been a variety of ways in which philosophers and theologians have claimed that we can recognize that we have duties of gratitude and what those duties might look like. But in addition to the idea of gratitude as a perhaps binding moral obligation, it seems to me that gratitude may play another very significant role in our lives as well, namely gratitude as motivation. Motivation to live in a certain way or behave in a certain way that takes us beyond simply thanking or returning favors to particular benefactors. One rather familiar examples of this, example of this expressed by Christians, Jews, and Muslims is a strong sense of desire to discover the will of God and do the will of God in this life, not out of fear, not simply from awe or wonder or respect, but out of a profound gratitude to God for what God has made possible for us. So for instance, the great medieval Jewish philosopher and theologian Moses Maimonides argued that the human being's most basic orientation to reality is gratitude together with humility toward God for the very existence of the world and for the wisdom of the created order. And that gratitude drives us to aspire to holiness and to resolve to fulfill God's commandments. Likewise, many Christians seek to do the will of God for their lives by following the teachings of Jesus because of their deep gratitude for God's love and saving grace toward them. Gratitude as motivation has plenty of non-religious manifestations too. To cite a, a popular and common example, patriotism and love of country are said by many to flow from a sense of gratitude for the benefits that one's nation makes possible and for the people who formed it and who have fought to protect it. Whether this might be called a moral obligation is a matter of great controversy among philosophers. But surely it is the case that many, if not most, patriotic souls would, if asked, declare that their patriotic impulses are indeed motivated by gratitude. In a similar vein, there is much philosophical debate about the extent to which I have a moral obligation or duty to obey the laws of my country and what reasons I might offer for that political obligation. Here again, 
While the notion of a moral duty of this sort might be hard to justify in a broad sense, I expect that many people do desire to be law-abiding citizens out of a sense of gratitude for the peace, order, and social cooperation that their country's political structure has made possible for them. Now, as we sense and respond to being motivated by gratitude over time, or as we recognize and try to fulfill our debts or obligations of gratitude over time, we can develop the settled habit or disposition to be grateful persons. Now, this is generally referred to as the virtue of gratitude. A virtue is, is a settled habit or disposition to act in a particular way. In my observations of people, at least, a developed disposition or habit of being grateful often means much more than a tendency to reliably thank other people or to try to reciprocate their generosity. It often t entails a fundamental change in our worldview, our view of who we are, of what we have, and of how we fit in the whole scheme of things. This, in my view, represents a third major role or function that gratitude plays in our lives. Namely, gratitude as interpretation or even transformation of our experiences. The more we develop the disposition to be a grateful kind of person, and the more we express gratitude, even if we're doing that out of force of habit, the more we are led to consider all that we might be grateful for. And in the process, in that process, our attention and our affections are turned toward those positives in our lives that might evoke gratitude. And the number and intensity of those positives begins to increase and to move to the front of our consciousness. And as a result, many of the negatives in our lives can no longer inhabit or control the front of our consciousness and we begin to interpret the quality of our experiences and even of our fundamental condition in a different way. For one thing, gratitude as a trait of character usually brings with it another generally noble trait of character, namely humility. When I'm aware of and grateful for what others have done to and for me, or even when I'm grateful that I can experience sunshine or fresh air or clean water, I am also necessarily reminded of all the things that, may, that make my life rich that I did not cause, I did not invent, I did not create. It reminds me that I am not and never could be a self-made person. And that humble recognition is not only profoundly realistic, but it is also likely to expand my appreciation and acceptance of others and to also dampen my impulses to denigrate or use others. Now, another interpretive result of gratitude as a habit or disposition is that it may indeed make us uncomfortable. As my cognitive and affective self focuses more and more on all the things I have to be grateful for, and I'm humble enough to see those things as more than simply my just do, then I may also become more aware of how, of how others do not have the things that I am most grateful for. And I may actually care that they are lacking in those things. It's possible that this could provoke a kind of caring paralysis, an anxious hand-wringing over the plight of others. More often, thankfully, it motivates us to respond to their plight so as to try to make it better so that they may have the opportunity or occasion to be grateful as we are grateful. And in that sense, at least, it might be said that gratitude helps make the world go round. Gratitude as interpretation, then, can lead us to see the world and others in the world from a more humble and altruistic perspective. But of course it does that while also giving us a more positive perspective on our own status and condition. The more I am driven in gratitude to contemplate the positives in my life, in who I am, what I, where I am, and what I have, the more satisfaction and fulfillment I'm able to find in my condition, even if others would see my condition as pretty bleak. 
I'm reminded here of one of my grandmother's little nuggets of wisdom that she would pull out every once in a while. Think about the, only, the old man who only had two teeth left in his head, but he was so thankful that those two teeth met. <laughs> and while many would argue about what it is that ultimately makes us happy, I would say based on my own observation that a key to happiness, if not the key to happiness, lies in the sense of satisfaction and fulfillment that we're able to find in our lives. So by offering us new and greater sources of satisfaction and fulfillment, gratitude can definitely be a key to happiness. To give but one example of what I mean by that, let me tell you about my friend Jim Cameron, who died several years ago at age 99. And incidentally, Jim was on the board of Mercy College of Detroit earlier in his life. Jim had been widowed in his 80s. And then I got to know him when he married his second wife, Mary Ann, who had been a long-term friend of mine. He was 92, and she was in her early 70s when they married. Jim was a retired corporate lawyer and a very active, independent, and intellectual person. But for the entire time that I knew him, he was losing one ability, one function, one activity after another. Driving his car, playing golf, walking on his own, going out to eat, getting out of his chair without help, and finally the ability to get out of bed or even turn himself in bed. With all those losses of independence and function, however, Jim did not dwell on what he couldn't do. In fact, he would sometimes even joke about what he couldn't do. He told me on more than one occasion why he had to quit playing golf at age 91. As he put it, at 91, he was still a very good putter, but every time he drove the ball, he fell over. So it was, it was time to quit golf. And then he would go, on, go right on to talk about how very much he had enjoyed being able to watch the golf tournament on television that week. Indeed, throughout the long decline in his health, I can never remember a single visit with Jim when he did not tell me how fortunate he was and how grateful he was for the love and good care of his wife and her children and grandchildren, for his hospice nurse, and for the good friends he had and for their visits. When he died, I remember thinking that here was a life that could reasonably be described under a single dominant trait, that of gratitude. And while I didn't know Jim for the first nine-tenths of his life, I can say for certain that the final tenth was a life very much worth living. I think he provides us all with a good role model, not simply of responding appropriately to motivations or obligations of gratitude, but of interpreting our lives gratefully through the lens of what we've been given and what is possible for us instead of what is lacking or not yet. I see this in my own father as well. My dad is 95 years old and is cared for in the skilled nursing unit of the retirement community where my parents live because of some physical debilities coupled with fairly advanced dementia. He can still recognize family and friends, even though he can't always call our names, but cannot recognize or remember new information about what's going on, about how to perform certain tasks, um, about how to ask for help or who to ask for help. For as long as I can remember, my dad has always been one to promptly acknowledge and express his gratitude or his thanks for anything given to him or done for him. We used to joke about how he tended to write a thank you note within 24 hours of receiving a gift, even when that gift was from someone in the household. <laughs> but now his gratefulness is clearly at the center of his personality. He might wince at the pain in his knees or show frustration at what he cannot remember or accomplish, but he always expresses gratefulness and appreciation for every little thing done for him, even if he doesn't recognize the person doing it or understand why they're doing it. And along with this has come what my younger brother calls a new sweetness about my dad, an attitude that includes not simply dealing with his limitations, but a focus on the positives that make him grateful, even though he cannot fully understand everything that's happening to him. And while 
I don't know anyone who would choose to be in the condition that my father is in. I certainly aspire to have the same attitude toward my condition that he has, whatever that condition for me might be. Well, since this is supposed to be a last lecture, I guess I should end with some kind of advice. So my advice would be this. Try to make a habit of contemplating all those persons and things that you have to be thankful for and grateful for and how they make your life better. Some writers, both religious and secular, have recommended that we take a moment before going to sleep each night just to identify and think about even just two or three things that have happened that day for which we're grateful. At the other end, my sister is very much a morning person, which I am not, and she rises at about 4.30 or 5 each morning to have time to think and pray and write before the rest of the house gets moving. And every morning, she makes a list of the people, the events, the activities, and the possibilities that she is thankful for. That kind of routine not only exercises and expands our sense of gratitude, but also puts us in a positive frame of mind for getting restful sleep at night and for facing the demands of our lives each morning. And as I've already noted, the cultivation of gratitude in ourselves not only gives others around us more to appreciate about us and with us, but also gives us more personal satisfaction, fulfillment, and happiness in our own living. Now, I began this lecture by recommending a movie. I want to end by recommending a song. This is a song that was written by Carol Bayer Sager, David Foster, and Richard Page. And it was recorded, well, among the people that recorded it, was Josh Groban on his 2007 Christmas album entitled Noel, although this is not really a Christmas song. The name of the song is Thankful. And the, word, the lyrics, in part, go like this. Some days we forget to look around us. Some days we can't see the joy that surrounds us. So caught up inside ourselves, we take when we should give. So for tonight, we pray for what we know can be. What, uh, and on this day, we hope for what we still can't see. It's up to us to be the change. And even though we all can still do more, there's so much to be thankful for. Look beyond ourselves. There's so much sorrow. It's way too late to say, I'll cry tomorrow. Each of us must find our truth. It's so long overdue. Even with our differences, there's a place we're all connected. Each of us can find each other's light. So for tonight, we pray for what we know can be. And on this day, we hope for what we still can't see. It's up to us to be the change. And even though this world needs so much more, there's so much to be thankful for. Thank you.